when you're outside the planet and you're looking down on it, it's immediately obvious that it's one planet. Every astronaut that flies into space will come back with the same information. You cannot see the borders of countries, right? You just see one thing, and it's, it's sort of like it's our spaceship, right? And we're all crew on that spaceship. And so it's very obvious that everything that happens on the planet is all connected to everything else that happens on the planet. And you see it differently. Also, you don't take it for granted. You know, for example, Nepal has beautiful nature. Because you live here, you probably don't notice it as much because you take it for granted because you see it every day. But me coming into the country and having a chance to tour around, it's like, oh my goodness, it's so beautiful here. Right? Same thing, you get off the planet and you look at the planet, it's like, oh my goodness, our planet is so special. So you learn not to take the planet for granted. We have to take care of it. Oh, I would love to, I mean, going back and living uh, on the space station would be really wonderful. The possibility to go to the moon or Mars is very intriguing, although I might not be the right age for that. But just the idea of exploring new things, it's very exciting. So when we're first selected into the astronaut corps, we have two years of training. And what we're training on are all the, the, the technology and the engineering that goes into building the spacecraft that we fly, how to do a spacewalk, how to do robotics, how to do photography, Russian language, uh, medical operations. So we train on generically these things. And then we're eligible for a flight assignment. Then when we get assigned to a mission, if it's a shuttle mission, we train for another year specifically for what we're going to do on that mission. When we train for a space station mission, which is a longer period of time, I trained for three and a half years, again, on everything that's possible to happen on the space station. Nowadays, the training is more like two and a half years, but when I was training, it was three and a half years. So being an astronaut, you're in school a lot. You're a student for a very long time. What is the rule of astronomy in day to day life? The rule of astronomy in, in day to day life? life. I think, I think astro so astronomy, of course, is the study of the stars in the universe, and I think people are fascinated with the photos, right? I think it, on, a, on an everyday basis, I think when people see pictures of the universe, the stars, like the Hubble Space Telescope has brought back so many spectacular pictures. I think when people see those pictures, it sparks curiosity and awe and wonder. And those feelings can carry over into our daily lives and keeps us alive as human beings and questioning things and, and continue to allow us to grow. So I think astronomy, taps that part of us that likes to explore and that, and that is enthralled by the mystery of the universe. Exactly what I just said, it's, it's a way for us, first of all, to understand more about the universe from a scientific viewpoint, but also from an everyday ordinary view of life, it gives us that opportunity to experience awe and wonder and believe in things bigger than ourselves. Well, common, just like you, you eat, you eat, you um, work, you know, just like a normal life, it's just you're doing it in space, right? The uncommon aspect of it is you're doing it all while you're floating, right? So you imagine living your daily life the way you do, but now you're in an environment where everything that you touch and everything that you do and every way you move, is, it's all floating. So think about your bedroom or your kitchen right now at home. Things are sitting on shelves. If you were in space, they wouldn't be sitting on the shelf because there's no gravity. So you have to think in space differently about everyday life. And that's the uncommon part because everything's wanting to float all the time. Okay, uh, so for me, astronomy is an edit business. It has nothing to do with people struggling to meet day to day needs. Uh, how can we find the connection with what you have been doing and what people in my country are struggling with? So I answered this question earlier, and I will use Langtang Valley as an example, right? As I was hiking in Langtang Valley, I noticed that people were using solar cells to heat their water. So they can have hot water very easily. They don't have to cut down trees and boil water anymore. Those solar cells came from the space industry. Because we needed to figure out how to, do, how to generate electricity in space, and it had to be sustainable. And so we can take the sun's energy, create a solar cell and turn that, uh, that, that heat from the sun into electrical engineer, electrical engineer and energy. And now, after a long period of time, as we've needed to make solar cells in space and improve them and make them more efficient, they've gotten cheaper and more affordable, and now they're in Lantang Valley heating water, 
right? So that has a direct, a direct applicability to people in Nepal. Now this, this evolution of technology doesn't happen overnight. It may take a decade, it may take two decades. But the fact that there are people who are creating new technologies anywhere in the world means that eventually those technologies will be available to everybody else in the world. And space requires an incredible advance of technology just to operate, whether it's a machine or a human. And that's the applicability to the people here in Nepal. And it's already happening. Uh, no Nepali has ever, ever been an astronaut so far. Uh, what steps can Nepal take to end this crisis? Well, I think first of all, it's extremely important to excite your youth about studying science, math, engineering, and technology. Because that's the, that's the language that we speak when we explore space. Those are the skills that you need. Just like if you're going to be a medical doctor, you must understand the human body. If you're going to engage in space exploration, whether that's as a Nepali astronaut, or is this really smart Nepali engineer who's helping to build equipment that flies in space? You have to be able to speak science and math and understand engineering and be comfortable with technology. And so finding ways to excite your youth and show them, male and female, that this is a wonderful opportunity for them will create the workforce and the excitement. And they will be very integral in where you might find an astronaut or how they might make connections internationally with people who have shared interest to create collaborative projects that will bring knowledge and opportunity to people in Nepal. But you have to get them excited about science and engineering. Uh, what is the future of astronomy in the world? I think, well, the future of, of exploration of space, whether it's astronomy, or humans is growing. There are so many countries involved globally sending satellites into space, get sending humans into space, interested in collaborating on space programs together. These arrangements are both multilateral, like the space station program, where 16 countries are working together, or bilateral. For example, the, the program that Nepal has with Japan to send uh, a CubeSat up. And these agreements are happening all over the world, and it would be lovely to see Nepal engaging in more of that as well. There's a wonderful future there. Uh, how did you feel about Nepalis and their interest in astronomy and space? I've, everyone's always excited to hear about space. I don't care where you live on the planet. People are fascinated about the idea of exploring space, and I find that no different here in Nepal. The, 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 the students I've engaged with, I've had the opportunity to speak at two schools, as well as here today at the, the National Academy of Science and Technology with some other students. They're very curious, they're very eager, they're very excited about, about the, science, the subject. And it's a good, space is actually a, a way that many countries, they use the subject as a way to excite their youth about science and technology, because it's a natural thing that people are interested in. Yes, and, and we've, I've talked with several people about this as well, and as I looked around the country, again, I've only been here two months, but as I've looked around the country, I can see that civil engineering is very important because you have to deal with earthquakes, and you're building roads, and you have to understand how to, to survive such, um, such earth shaking. Uh, you have hydroelectric power here, and I feel like that's very important, so how you collect that energy and create those power plants and store and distribute the energy, conservation, environmental science, I think there's a lot of natural engineering and science disciplines that the country could build off of. What are the biggest hurdles I face today? Um, usually my hurdles are self-inflicted, right, because uh, I, I, have, I have to make sure I learn the lessons I'm supposed to be learning from every experience so that I can grow in the appropriate way. Um, I'm, even though I'm a female in a male-dominated field, I've had good respect for my colleagues and I think that's because I try and be professional and I work really hard and, and I gain the respect. So I think that's true for, for anyone in any field. If you try those things, you're going to be you're going to be doing rather well. I think the biggest problem is I don't have enough time to do all the things that I want to do. <laughs> How does it feel to identify 
the USF as an astronaut? I feel very, very fortunate to have gotten to do the things that I've done. And it was a dream of mine, and I was very lucky to have my dream come true. So I take the responsibility uh, very seriously, which is why I try and talk with students whenever I, I get opportunities to. But I, I feel very, very lucky to, to call myself an astronaut. Uh, what is a D? 24 hours in a space look like? Yeah, so it's, it's like a, kind of like a normal work day, except we're in space. We, we get up in the morning, we have some time to have breakfast and get ourselves ready for work. And then we have a daily planning conference, which takes place with all of the control centers around the world. They've created our schedule for the day, so they have a, a list of work that they would like for us to get done. And our daily planning conference is all about us understanding what they're requesting. And then we just start following the schedule that they've built for us. We have lunch, we make sure we exercise, that's very important. <music>